Well, hello and welcome. So the syndemic threat of COVID-19 plus chronic health diseases. What is the syndemic? How dangerous is it? What can be done to address it? Well, thank you all for joining this first of a series of webinars tackling the topic of the double impact or syndemic of coronavirus and long-term health conditions with this first event focusing on diabetes. We're looking at the problem, we're looking at solutions, including unlocking the potential of the European health data space to improve diabetes management. My name is Sue Saville. I was the medical correspondent at Britain's ITV News for many years, and I'm delighted to be guiding you through these discussions today. After our initial speakers, we will have a panel discussion and we welcome your questions. So please do submit them on the Q&A function that you'll find on your screens. We are recording this event, so you will be able to watch a replay later on the FPIA website and the EUDF website. So to introduce today's theme, here's Maurizio Guidi. He's the co-chair of the FPIA Diabetes Platform. Maurizio. Thank you very much, Sue. Good morning. And thank you very much for being with us uh, to this uh, very important webinar that is co-organized uh, by FPIA Diabetes Platform and the European Diabetes Forum. FPIA Diabetes Platform is a diabetes-specific working group with within uh, the umbrella of FPIA. It is composed by six companies operating in diabetes that grouped together almost three years ago, starting from uh, realizing that since diabetes is a significant public health challenge, we needed a more unity and a collaborative approach. This is true for all the stakeholders operating in diabetes, but also true for the company operating in diabetes. So we know that uh, diabetes is a significant public uh, uh, health challenge. Today, 60 million of uh, European citizens are living with diabetes. The forecast for uh, 2030 is that up to 66 million, more than the Italian population, for example. And uh, it's, diabetes is not only so prevalent, but also is an incredible, dramatic killing disease. In the few minutes that I'm going uh, to welcome you and uh, introduce uh, 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 all the webinar, uh, more than 40 people will die for diabetes or for the complication of diabetes. So one person every eight seconds. For this reason, also, diabetes is uh, absorbing a lot of resource. Currently, 150 billion of euros are dedicated to diabetes. 75% of these overall costs are driven by complication. So investing in diabetes is very, very important. And it's the right thing to do, but also, if we can delay or prevent complication, that will save lives and also optimize the resources that are available. So very important is to make sure that diabetes is perceived as a relevant disease. The impact of COVID on diabetes has also been uh, very dramatic. We know that uh, several data are showing that uh, uh, the percentage of people with diabetes in the emergency room or the increased uh, need of uh, medical uh, mechanical ventilation, as well as also the impact on, uh, on the risk of death. Um, in a very interesting uh, survey carried out by the International Diabetes Federation Europe, one out of two people with diabetes reported the deteriorating mental health. One out of three also had an increased of uh, uh, variability of the glucose control. And also, according to WHO, one out of two countries reported severe disruption of uh, diabetes services. So the COVID-19 is interacting with uh, 
a lot of uh, uh, disease definitely is interacting, impacting heavily on you know, people with diabetes, creating a, a systemic threat. In today's webinar, we are going uh, to discuss the potential of the health data registry and uh, also the European health data space to improve the management uh, of the pandemics, including also diabetes and diabetes as a, as a case study. In October, as anticipated, uh, uh, we will have a different seminar, more focused on the integration of care and how the member state also can benefit from uh, uh, managing better the uh, health condition of vulnerable communities such as uh, uh, people with diabetes. Saying that, thank you very much for being with us today and also in the future. And I will uh, give the stage back to you soon. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, Maurizio. My gosh, what dramatic statistics you gave there. 40 people will die in the time that we're going to be on air. One every eight seconds, absolutely phenomenal. And we've talked at the top there about this syndemic. We've heard, of course, about epidemics in the past. We've all become familiar with pandemics. This concept of the syndemic, let's try to understand a little bit more about that. And to help us here, I'm very pleased to introduce to you Tammy Boyce. She is the Senior Research Associate at UCL Institute of Health Equity. Tammy, over to you. Thanks, Sue, and uh, many thanks to FPA and the European Diabetes Forum for inviting me here today to talk to you. Um, uh, as Sue said, I, uh, if we could start the slides for my presentation. Um, thanks very much. I think it's, it's an interesting time to be working in diabetes because I think there's been quite a bit of media attention and it's a real opportunity, isn't it, to increase awareness. But it's, it's not necessarily the right reasons to, or it's a little bit worrying at times, I think, for some of the patients that you're caring for. If we could, the next slide, please. This is a story that is based on research in England. It's based on research carried out right at the beginning of the pandemic um, from March to May, 2020. And this is uh, not a surprise to, I suppose, any of you. It's uh, one in three people who died from COVID-19 in hospital had diabetes. So, you know, this is a worry for people, it's an opportunity, but what we're talking about here today is about data. And that's what I'd like to focus on today. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about syndemic, but really I think there's an opportunity here to, 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 to use the way we've, to see what we've done with data in COVID and the, cap the capabilities of the data to, to show what the problems are. So if we go to the next slide, it's not just, you know, the top headline is that one of three people from, uh, dying from COVID had diabetes. But if we dig a little bit deeper, what we can look at is the increased mortality for both type one and type two diabetes. Yes, it was men. Yes, it was older people. We know that. But also if we look at some of the factors that you didn't necessarily think might occur, that if you're not white and from a black and ethnic minority background, or if you are living in a more deprived area or have a more deprived background, you know, let's be, be honest and speak clearly, if you're poor, you also have an increased risk. So how does all of that fit into the concept of uh, syndemic? Next slide, please. So we know what an epidemic is. We all should know. It's the spread of disease affecting large numbers. We've all come to know what pandemic means in the last year. And it took a while for the WHO to, to call this a pandemic. For, for various reasons, but they have to be very specific. And I think we'll revisit the meaning of this word in subsequent years, but it's the worldwide spread of disease. And so then along came this word syndemic, which has been used in the last, I think it was uh, 10 or so years. And what does it mean? Well, really it's about the virus isn't acting in isolation, but I suspect anyone who's worked at NCDs knows that these types of conditions do not exist in isolation. You know, we have comorbidities that interact with each other. There are certain risk factors that are increased and our outcomes get worse. So I think the thing for me to think about in terms of the syndemic is that the, the virus wasn't acting in isolation. But what does that mean? Because not everyone with diabetes got COVID-19. 
um, or died from COVID-19. If we go think about that previous slide. So who was it? You know, there was, yes, men and older people, but also, as we said, it, it was poorer people, people from black and ethnic minority backgrounds. And that's why this matters, because we can better understand if we have better data, what the impact of COVID is and can we um, perhaps protect these populations in the future. So I think the, 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 the concept of syndemic actually is quite a positive notion because it helps us in digging deeper and looking for the interactions with the virus, we can find more solutions. Uh, next slide, please. Because this is what we're used to in my background researching health inequalities is we're always looking at the causes of the causes. We're not just looking, you know, what causes diabetes at a physical level. You all know the answer to that. And I know that, but you, you know, I'm asking you to dig deeper that why are, why are, why are we seeing certain uh, populations that have are at a higher risk of diabetes or any disease at, or COVID. So this was a paper that was written by uh, Claire Bambra and she came up with this uh, diagram. So I think it's interesting because this is what we typically uh, use in health inequalities to explain the causes of health inequalities. So we're talking about um, the social and community networks. We're also talking about education, the impact of work and unemployment, but right at the center of that um, sim or that figure is NCDs. You probably can't, you can't see it. It's not it's not big enough. But that's the existence of of what's happening with COVID. If we're thinking about all of the causes that are were affecting the high rates of COVID nineteen um, around the world. Um, so it is a it is a useful concept. Yeah. And if we're going to address COVID nineteen, we also have to address NCDs. And that's what this figure really is showing us. Um, next slide, please. And as I said, the causes of the causes, that's what health inequalities research is all about. And Michael Marmot, who I work with at UCL, this was the closing the gap in a generation, the first big report that the World Health Organization did, published in 2008, but many years in the making, that really was the first to put the idea that social justice is killing on a grand scale out there in the world and getting people talking about health inequalities. Researchers had been trying to had been trying to get the attention for years. Why are, are people on low incomes dying at, at faster rates and getting sicker? And why do they have um, lower life expectancies? And so this grabbed the world's attention. And then in, in England, we wrote a, 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 a substantial report called Fair Society, Healthy Lives that was published in 2010. And both of these reports, next slide, and the following, these two reports published in, this one published in 20, both of these published in 2020 are really driven by data. We are, if you look at any of them, and in fact, we actually get criticized for having too much data. Um, but what we hope to do in, in creating these reports is that it gives the opportunity for people to really dig into these and get the data that they want from it to make their arguments. So they are hefty, substantial reports driven by data and showing that there are options there. Um, and we're talking about a range of issues that are the causes of the, of the causes of health inequalities. We're talking about giving children the best start in life, about good employment, good work, good employment, good quality employment, having a healthy standard of living, a, a minimum income for living or a basic income, which has become quite topical in the last few years. And also, you know, the healthy and sustainable places and communities and housing that people live in. And certainly in terms of um, some NCDs, housing is a, a significant issue. Um, and also ill health prevention and dealing with NCDs is, is an issue that we talk about. Um, next slide, please. And this is the kind of research that we're doing. Um, we're talking about uh, life expectancy. This is uh, from the Build Back Fair uh, research that was published towards the end of 2020, showing that um, you can see in terms of most deprived on the left side of both of those charts, those are the people on the lowest incomes and, <clears throat> excuse me, their mortality rates were much higher than people living in the least deprived or the richer areas. So that's IMD is 
what we use in the United Kingdom to look at the um, multiple deprivation level. So this is a geography based um, analysis. So uh, we're looking at people's postcodes and, and their incomes based on postcodes. So what we can see is from both COVID and non-COVID that people are dying. Um, people on low incomes are more, were more likely to have a higher mortality rate. Next slide, please. So what does that mean for diabetes? Um, what does that mean in terms of data? Um, so we can look at the uh, many thousand, as millions as, as Maurizio let us know who have diabetes. So these are the sort of typical statistics I, I should imagine you all know uh, that are going around. And if we go to the next slide, you know, it's not just we're talking about the numbers of people who have diabetes, but what I'm saying is that the data can provide you with evidence of who has diabetes. So if we look at this, this is from the WHO European database. So the percentage of adults who are reporting diabetes. And one of the issues when we're looking at health inequalities in Europe is that many countries are reluctant to include data on income. And so in terms of doing inequalities research, what we do instead is use years of education. So what's important here is if you look at the red dots and the red dots are showing you a higher likelihood of, or of people, you have diabetes. So what you can see in women is that people with fewer years of education are more likely to have diabetes. You can see a, a fairly straight gradient as we would say. In men, it's a slightly more mixed picture, uh, but I think what you can also see is there's an overlap between many of the green dots and the red dots, but that's the, what data can do for you if you dig a bit deeper. And if we go to the next slide, you can also look at the causes. So again, I'm looking at the causes of um, diabetes. So again, we're looking at obesity. Um, and again, if you look at the red dots, people with fewer years of education, they're more likely to be obese. And again, that's a slightly mixed picture for men, but still you're having the green and the red dots, um, both of these. And so what does that mean? I mean, it's telling you that if you have one consistent message, it's perhaps not necessarily going to be that effective if you're telling fairly middle-class people who have money to make certain decisions, but really the decisions that, or the people that you should be talking at is people on lower income. So that, that might affect the solutions or interventions you implement. Next slide, please. And we know uh, this is uh, based on socioeconomic status. So before we were looking at number of years in education, this is again from, from the UK because we have the data there to show that people who are wealthier on the left side of this chart are less likely to be obese than those who are who are wealth who are have lower income. Next slide please. And we know in terms of obesity and COVID that the people who um, were overweight and obese were more likely to be in hospital. So this is uh, data, you know, that we, I think it's the, 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 the what the data can provide to you um, can help you understand and also talk to the public about it. You know, if people who were obese knew that they, uh, the statistics showed that they were uh, much more likely to be admitted to the ICU, they were much more likely to be end up in hospital and they were much more likely to die if they were obese. So these are all statistics that we should be talking to people about, which will also help you with your diabetes um, messaging. Next slide, please. And also if we think about one of the other causes, it's not just obesity, but we also think about physical activity. And again, this is from Eurostat. If you look at the yellow column, these are people with fewer years of education. And I think what's really important here is that who's doing no exercise? you know, you're twice as likely for people with fewer years, the, the least amount of years in education, you're twice as likely to do no exercise. And you know, what does this mean for people? This was when you could go to the gym. So what did this mean for people during lockdown? Who was doing no exercise? Next slide, please. And what we know, and again, in Britain, 
we have excellent data because the Office for National Statistics went crazy during COVID and provided us with a great deal of data. But we know that, um, and again, I think it's looking at the final two, the final the columns about neither more, nor, more or less or more. What we can see is people in the AB um, employment categories, which are wealthier, uh, their management, professional workers, they were either they're, um, <clears throat> they were more likely to do more exercise, whereas people in skilled or semi-skilled or unemployed were, their exercise really just didn't change that much or they weren't as likely to increase their, their physical activity. They were doing other things and there's lots more research. And I think one of the important things to look at here is also who did this research. This was done, as you can see, the source for this is Sport England. And this is what has also happened in the last few, few years, and maybe the last year, is that there's been a great deal of attention about trying to understand the causes of the causes in different parts of the sort of world. Because I think the, it used to just be academics like myself and epidemiologists, and now other people are trying to understand people who support people to do exercise or to try any better. How can they better message their, the work that they're doing? Next slide, please. And one of the reasons that people weren't, you know, again, if we're looking at the causes of the causes, why weren't people with on low incomes exercising? And this was a really interesting puzzle to put together. If you think about who had an access to a garden, again, you can see from the, um, the figure on the left that people in management were had, these were people who didn't have access. So uh, most people in A, B or C, so they're wealthier, they had access to gardens, but that's one in 20% of people who were skilled or semi-skilled or unemployed, they didn't have access to gardens in England. And if you dig even a little bit deeper and use that, your sort of data detective skills, you can see, um, and again, this was Natural England doing this research, that if we look at it by ethnicity, the red column shows that people from black ethnicity were most likely not to have access to a garden. And that's because they're living in flats in cities mainly. So again, I think this is really interesting about looking at the causes of the causes and trying to understand what was going on. Next slide, please. And this is European data. So it's not just in Britain that we have this data, you can look at the people reporting difficulty accessing. So if your number's higher, it's not a good thing. So we can look at a country like there's Albania, Montenegro, you could see uh, women not being able to access, having a great deal of problems accessing uh, recreational or green spaces. But really, you know, those red dots are all over to the right, meaning that those people with fewer years of education are having more difficulty accessing green spaces. Um, and what about access to healthcare? If we go to the next slide, this is based on uh, research in the UK and it's looking at um, who is getting the best treatments. So, you know, the numbers here, what we can see is that if they're, these are looking at um, the eight care processes recommended by NICE and also some other treatment targets. But if you just look at the who's getting them, and I, and I think it's useful to have separated out to type one and type two, is that why is there any difference at all? Even if some of them are quite small, you know, um, there's only a difference, say, between 39 and 41 percent in terms of the treatment targets for blood pressure um, and cholesterol. But the other in other areas, some of those differences are seven percent, six percent. But why? Why? That doesn't have to be. This is clinicians working with patients. Everyone should be getting the same care. But still, we know that there's inequalities in diabetes care. We know there's inequalities in diabetes prevalence, and we know there's inequalities in diabetes related complications. And my point is, we can do better. We can definitely do better. Next slide. This is based on a 153 um, randomized control trials. They did a, a Cochrane review of it. And I think what's interesting here is what is being concentrated on. Um, you know, we have the data to know that 
the interventions we should be looking at, but they are not the interventions that are being implemented. So can we do better? We can. Next slide. It's almost my last one, Sue. So what can we do? And we always say this in our health inequalities research, we can adopt a proportionate universalist approach where we're, we have universal uh, interventions and solutions, but where you know that there are communities in need, you have to make that additional effort. You can't expect it just to happen. And we need properly funded public health systems because they're the ones most in most countries carrying out this data analysis. And they need to be able to provide that structure to provide that backbone for us. So, and my final slide is looking forward. We cannot look through a single lens. That's what the syndemic argument is talking about. You know, we really, if we look at a single lens in terms of uh, diabetes, we'll be in the same mess the next time a pandemic comes around. We have to look at the drivers and that's why we've got a delivery driver there. We have to look at the causes of chronic disease. We have to look at what was driving the disease that in COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic. And we know that we have to think about inequalities. We have to think about poverty and we can be better prepared for the future to provide good care for everyone. Thank you. Tammy Boyce, thank you very much indeed for those insights, understanding the causes of the causes and how important, of course, all that data is. Um, do stay with us for the panel. Um, but first to get a, an understanding of how this complex integration then of the two diseases might be addressed through health data registries um, with reference to diabetes. Um, I'm delighted now to introduce Jeanette Söderberg. She's the European Research Director at JDRF which is the leading global organization funding type one diabetes. Jeanette, over to you. Thank you. Um, could I have my slides, please? Thank you. Well, so first, Tammy, thanks a lot for that introduction. It kind of set the stage very well. And thanks you for, for having me at this discussion. And could I have the next one, please? Thanks. I'm picking up a thread which Tammy was talking about, which is, a reminder of the situation from last year. So this is data from England, where normally 5% or a bit more perhaps uh, of people, of the whole population are people with diabetes. However, when we looked at the effects of COVID and the deaths that we saw in hospitals, more than 30% of, of patients actually had diabetes in the beginning. And this kind of shows how it is extremely important and critical for us to gain insights on why this is, what is the relationship between COVID and diabetes in order to prevent complications in the future and fairly to save lives. Could I have the next one, please? Um, interestingly enough, people without diabetes also presented with very high levels of, of blood sugar at the hospitals and uh, they, they presented with something that we call persistent hyperglycemia, which is high blood sugars that are difficult to get down even if you give them insulin. Um, in these graphs, the, the blue bars are the ones who have high blood sugar levels with or without diabetes. And you see, and, and with and without other types of conditions that are comorbidities, such as high blood pressure or, or um, respiratory failures or obesity. And you see that in all these four graphs, the, blood, the blue ones are at the very top, which basically means that hyperglycemia, high blood glucose, worsens the outcomes in all groups. And it is also an independent predictor of mortality in COVID with or without diabetes, which means that something very particular is going on with this COVID situation, which is um, affecting diabetes by diabetes, of, of course, it seems to be affecting COVID. Could I have the next one, please? And, and indeed, this is Stefano Del Prato's group who made a fantastic summary of what we know currently. One more click, please. Thanks. Um, which is that the relationship between diabetes and COVID-19 is bidirectional. Um, on one hand, you have uh, people with diabetes who are having worse outcomes from COVID because of these associated uh, underlying conditions such as inflammation or older age or hypertension or renal disease. One more click. Thanks. But on the other hand, what you have is 
uh, something that seems to be new. You have these people without diabetes who present with high levels of blood sugar. Um, we see indications that show that um, the COVID virus seems to be able to bind to the beta cells in the pancreas, which produce insulin. And um, the and these might be a trigger for, for new onset diabetes. We also see beta cell damage, which is normally what you see in type 1 diabetes, but there doesn't seem to be an autoimmune uh, connection. And all of this makes sure that we know that diabetes can make COVID worse, but COVID also seems to make diabetes, if not worse, perhaps cause it. Could I have the next one, please? And of course, if COVID may trigger diabetes, it begs a lot of questions such as what is the mechanism? Is this a, a type one diabetes? Is this a type two diabetes? Is it a, a new other types of diabetes? And of course, what people want to know is, is this reversible? Will I be able to, to not have this once I recover from my COVID? We know from previous research that virus infections can cause autoimmunity, not only diabetes, but other types of autoimmunity as well. And what would be interesting to know is, has the incidence of type 1, which is an autoimmune diabetes, has that increased because of COVID? Have other diseases increased? And now that we have this light at the end of the tunnel, that we're nearing the end of the, the pandemic, we have all these people who present with post-acute COVID syndromes, which seems to be uh, related to inflammation and, and perhaps brain inflammation. What is that and how do we treat it? And what has been spectacular to see during this COVID pandemic is how quickly people have gathered together to work together and gather as much data as possible. So we have large, these are just a few, but there are more large registries of data focusing on PEDS, focusing on, on type one or just the, the COVID IAP registries uh, any type of diabetes and any type of data related to COVID and diabetes, where people have tried to gather as much information as possible to, to be able to move forward and answer the questions above and more than that. Could I have the next one, please? Um, of course, the opportunities of data is to answer the scientific questions such as we had on the last slide and, and understand the, the roots and the mechanisms of the disease. But, there are more opportunities gathering data and working together. The, the obvious one is, of course, to improve patient-doctor relationship and communication based on data, have a more um, thoughtful discussion made on shared decision of what is good for the patient and promote the, the patient health. From a hospital point of view, more data allows them to uh, share best practices understand when things have gone wrong, gone bad, share those experiences and, and improve healthcare. And on a, on a societal level, across institutional level, what we can with all this data is to improve the quality and the quantity of research studies that we have ongoing to accelerate research in all fields, diabetes as well as COVID. But more importantly, perhaps is what Tammy was talking to you before is, uh, the, the better design of payment models and, and define what is ideal quality of care, because it has been evident during the pandemic that uh, healthcare currently is very unequal, that um, we have people who are completely under underprivileged and underserved, and they are faring much worse than people who are uh, in other socioeconomic classes. And we, we need to address that. And this is an opportunity to use data and make the decisions um, based on very much data evidence. Next, please. In, in addition to just using the, the new COVID registry, which was a full of information, what would be fantastic if we could link these to the diabetes registries that we have in Europe. Um, this is the work that was done by a European project called EU BIROD, which ran between 2012 and 2017, I believe, and it's the work of Fabrizio Carcini and Massimo Massi uh, mainly, they mapped all the different um, data sets and resources that we have across Europe in diabetes and came to the conclusion that they are of very different types. Um, we have population-based registries, we have audit and surveillance systems, national databases for quality, uh, and then we have different types and, and levels of smaller data sources such as academic uh, data sets or regional data sets. 
And what EU Byron found is that all of these have high quality information, but they're heterogeneous and pretty fragmented. And of course, this is because they are collected for different purposes. And that has also led to the fact that they are not based on standardized measures. Um, and they are difficult to compare on an international level. And because of, of this idea of having different types of um, data sources for different reasons, that the principles for data sharing and connecting to others are very different. So we are in a, in a situation where we have a lot of data, a lot of good quality data in Europe, but it's difficult for us to use them. Next one, please. Uh, and of course, coming back to what we can do in the future, standardized data is needed for meaningful comparison. It's a lot harder, of course, to compare apples to oranges than it is to compare apples to apples. My point with this slide is to show you that even though we have this wealth of data in Europe, it's not as easy as putting them on in one huge database and say, let's run artificial intelligence algorithms in this and come up with conclusions. That may be possible for some of the data sets, but absolutely not for all, because the data was collected for different purposes. So what we need to get over this hump is, is collaboration. Uh, we need more access to the data, but also we need to use it and make sure that we can work on cleaning it up and transforming it in a factory, in a manner that makes us be able to use it together. Next one, please. So, well, a bit too quick. So I wanted to mention uh, that the European Diabetes Forum is doing fantastic work gathering all stakeholders in the field to first show what data they have and then discuss ways forward in how we can make it interoperable and analyze it together. And perhaps also entertain the idea of building a new European diabetes health data space, which is the idea that the European Commission has, which is a framework uh, a ground for us to work together, um, a, a meaningful place where we can share data uh, and have that facilitated by regulatory means and so on that, that makes that, that work much easier. Next, please. One thing that I'd like to emphasize when we talk about this data that we have, that we have so much of it, and now that we are preparing the ground for collaborating and for sharing the data and analyzing it together, there's one thing that we need to remember, which is the patient centricity and the focus on why we are doing this. And why we're doing this is to make lives of people living with the disease better. And to do that, we need to collect something that some researchers are not very used to collect. And it's becoming more and more important people understanding why it is important. I just wanted to emphasize it here as well. Patient reported outcomes are information coming from the patient themselves, talking about their perspective on the disease. Things like pain or fatigue or distress uh, are things that cannot be measured in a lab, but need the patient to tell us about how they're feeling and gives a fuller picture of the disease. From a very practical standpoint, uh, pharmaceutical industry and FPA have been fantastic and standardized these PROs and incorporating them into clinical trials. And the reason for that is that if we do put a drug onto the market and people say that, well, this drug is fantastic, but it gives me both distress, pain, and fatigue, I don't want to use it. We spend quite a lot of resources developing this drug for patients who then don't want to use it because it causes them distress and, and other factors that are negative. So we need to take the patient perspective into account. Um, the, the logos that you have on the bottom are organizations and projects who are focusing on exactly this, capturing outcomes, not only clinical outcomes or process outcomes from the hospitals, but the patient's view and the patient's voice in this. Um, I'm gonna mention H2O, which is a, a newly started project by IMI. So it's an initiative from the European Commission together with FP and the pharmaceutical industry where we are building an infrastructure in Europe to collect patient reported outcomes to be able to merge and analyze that together with clinical outcomes. So you have both the lab work and the hardcore medical outcomes as well as the perhaps softer but patient reported ones to understand the full picture. And, and with that data set, we will be able to understand 
first of all, things like we don't know today, like this post-COVID situation, post-COVID syndrome, what does that feel for people with both diabetes and COVID? How does that feel for other patient groups? And what can we do to alleviate their symptoms and make their lives better and give them the quality life they deserve? I, I want to mention one last thing, which is that the data that is patient-centric is always sensitive data. This is private data that concerns someone's health, that concerns someone's opinion of their health, and all of that needs to be handled with extreme care. So when we build this data source, these data resources and data infrastructures, we need to be mindful of what it is we do and make sure that we have a governance in place that enables analysis and utilization of this data at the very maximum, but still protects the patient. Next, please. So just before I give this over to the panel to discuss, uh, I wanted to give you my take home messages. The, the first would be that this COVID diabetes syndemic has highlighted that there is a complex interaction between the two diseases. Diabetes seems to affect COVID and COVID seems to um, exacerbate diabetes. The registry data that we have provides a fantastic opportunity to address this, both the, ep the diabetes epidemic, but also the COVID influence on it. But in order to, to do that, we need more collaboration to both access the data, which is now kept in silos, and to use it. Data that is not being used is, well, useless. Um, and then we need implementation strategies to bring the results from these common analysis into clinical practice where it has a difference and makes a meaningful impact on lives of people. And my last point is, while we do all of this, we need to be mindful and protect the data and make sure that we have a um, framework in place to do this in a thoughtful and respectful manner. But the opportunity is there, and I'm looking forward to the panel discussion on this. Thank you. Jeanette Söderberg, thank you very much for your very informative presentation there. That's so helpful, and thank you for staying on for our panel. Um, in addition to the three speakers we've already heard from, I'd like to introduce three more to join our panel. Uh, we have uh, Jay Dierpal, he is the advisor to the International Diabetes Federation, IDF, and the co-founder of an organization called WellTech. Chantal Mathieu, she is the Senior Vice President, the European Association for the Study of Diabetes, EASD, and also the Chair of the European Diabetes Forum, EUDF. We have Adrian Sanders, the Secretary General, Parliamentarians for Diabetes Global Network, PGGN. Uh, and very much a oh, great welcome to you all. Thank you for joining this panel. There's so much in there to discuss from the presentation so far and so many other issues coming up. I would say to the audience, please put your questions in. We will get to as many um, as we can. It would be really lovely to know what you'd like to know. But to, to kick off, to get a little bit of an idea, uh, I'd be interested, if I may say, um, Adrian and Jay, if it's okay, that you have personal experience of type 1 diabetes. So I'm wondering for each of you, if you could say very briefly, whether you feel that with all the attention on COVID and other conditions, maybe like cancer, has diabetes lost its voice? Uh, Jay, what would you say? Uh, thanks, Sue, and thanks to everyone for inviting me. Um, I, I think my, my opinion there is on a personal basis, my diabetes care has become more coordinated, if anything, during the pandemic. More, from a perspective of, of an individual, I, I wanted my care to go more digital prior to, um, you know, prior to the pandemic coming in anyway. Um, and as you know, someone that's kind of running around doing a very busy job during the pandemic as well, my day job has been to support in the pandemic as well. So I haven't had a huge amount of time. So running around to forced, you know, physical appointments and things like that um, was not going to be easy. So the ability or the forced, uh, the forced nature of the, the hospital needing to go digital, the GPs needing to go digital, um, and, and that being kind of almost imposed on them was useful to me as an individual. I think as a, as a collective, if I look across the board, I'm very lucky, you know, because I live in a country where that was possible, whereas <laughs> I've got colleagues across Europe from the IDF world who I know didn't have that uh, ability to, to do that and their care did become much more fragmented so the the experience across Europe is still so very variable um, and and I think that's one of the big things I took away from the conversations was I think the next uh, decade of, of diabetes is all going to be about democratizing opportunity 
Um, and, and that's where I can kind of see the biggest opportunity now with what's happened with the pandemic is that now with the registries and data, we have the real world evidence to start to democratize some of that opportunity of access. Thank, thank you. And Adrian, again, on a, on a personal note, if you pop on your microphone, uh, what, what's your experience? Do you think uh, briefly that diabetes has lost its voice in all of this? I think we definitely have two pandemics. Uh, diabetes was the original pandemic before COVID, my experience is exactly the same as has just been described. Um, it is the one silver line with COVID is the growth of telemedicine um, in some of the developed countries. And as mentioned, it's not true across the world. If anything, the gap between the rich and poor countries' healthcare systems has widened from our monitoring and, and, and membership. There are some healthcare systems that are collapsing. There are others that are barely keeping up, but are keeping their head above water. Whilst there are others that have really held their own, mostly in Western Europe, and, and the English speaking countries around the world, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, for example. Thank you. And with COVID then, of course, it, it has brought a unique set of circumstances and also shown the value of, of health data. We've had the tracking and tracing, um, identifying those most at risk on a personal or a community level, um, reaching people for vaccination. So I'm wondering, Chantal, perhaps to bring you in, do you think some of the lessons on the health data might be valuable and be picked up in this space? Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate also, Adrian, just mentioning diabetes was the original epidemic uh, because that's my big fear that and, and I also see it happening with now the big focus on COVID as you know the thing is that we forget all these non-communicable diseases that underlie and have been going on for years and years affecting truly the whole world and uh, that we shouldn't forget. Now what, what I have learned from this pandemic uh, when coming back to data and the importance of uh, registries or whatever, is first of all that data need to be trusted. And uh, Jeanette alluded to uh, uh, Massimo uh, uh, Massi Benedetti's work on uh, bringing together all the um, evidence, uh, the registries that there are throughout Europe. And, and they are very different one from another. And so the first thing we need is to have trusted data, trusted uh, uh, registries. And I really look forward to this uh, European Health Data Space Initiative because that is what we need. And that is where very often in COVID it has gone wrong, namely our data trusted. We, I have a colleague who says there is evidence-based medicine before and after COVID. Um, before COVID, all data were reviewed and scrutinized and, and now we just publish, I can even say rubbish. There's too many, too much data. So uh, trusted data sources and trusted data are the first, but second also uh, use the data, do something with the data, not just collect data for collecting them, but look at the data with, with scientific rigor, if I may say. Uh, because otherwise it, it also goes wrong. And thirdly, uh, also communicate correctly about the data. I mean, I don't know the audience, but very often when we talk about COVID and diabetes, when you ask people afterwards, what have you learned? They say, ah, diabetes predisposes you to COVID. No, it doesn't. It just predisposes you to worse outcomes with COVID. So, it's, it's a very delicate discussion about data, data registries. Yes, we need them, but they need to be solid. We need to look at them in a very strict way, but also we need to communicate and, and use the data in a correct way, because otherwise it, it will be like herding cats all over the place and data will not help us. If anything, they will lead us astray. 
Thank you. And let's pick up that point about that uh, importance of getting the right data. Um, a, a question that's come in, and thank you very much from Lars Stollenberg, saying um, standardization of data will clearly be crucial to enable interoperability and compare apples to apples, as in that presentation. Um, how could these standards be made applicable in the EU across member states? Um, he is saying there the Commission suggests either certification labeling or an authorization scheme, which do you prefer? Um, Maurizio, could I bring you in there? Does that, does that uh, have any resonance for you? Which of those for standardization, what would you say, Maurizio? Well, definitely the European Earth Data Space is a great opportunity for, uh, for uh, uh, addressing these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, complex uh, problem of the standardization. Definitely, as uh, Chantal said, the data has to be in place, has to be relevant and reliable. But I would like also, if you allow me, to uh, highlight one piece that is about uh, what to do with the data has uh, been already expressed. And uh, while uh, uh, data registry uh, can be obviously very useful for publication, or for cost containment uh, uh, reason, they are extremely legitimate. I think that uh, we suggest that uh, data registries should be focused and aim to improve outcomes, should drive a different clinical behaviors in order to improve outcomes. That's to me what uh, also is uh, extremely important. So the standardization for what? The standardization probably has to be also uh, uh, addressed according to the, the goal that this data registry should uh, uh, have. And to me, the improvement of the, of the outcome is a key priority. Thank you. And on the health European health data space, the consultation now on that is, is open. Um, the aims of the European health data space looking to include fostering a genuine single market then for digital health services and products, including innovation. Um, I'm wondering how valuable this, this might be for diabetes. Jeanette, picking up on some of your threads there, what, what's your take on the EHDS? What, what promise could it give? I think it's a fantastic opportunity. This is something we need, and it's what, what Mauricio and Chantal were talking about as well, that we need a framework to be able to share data, harmonize data, but especially use the data. And that, that's the focus of, of the program, and that's also the focus on, on most of people who gather the data. That's what they, they do it for. So I do believe that having this European standardized framework with harmonization opportunities give us more more opportunities for, for better research, but also for innovation and have small and medium-sized companies in mind who might be able to grow from participating in collaborations with, with other stakeholders. And we have a more dynamic European field for, for diabetes. So I, I think this is very timely and it's exactly what we do need in this case. However, the proof is in the pudding, which means that we need to see how this is gonna work so it doesn't become a, a framework which is so complicated that people can't navigate it and can't use it. But the opportunity is definitely there. And um, I'm really grateful that they have this consultation so we can provide input into legislation. Thank you. Uh, and it'd be lovely to know a bit more about our audience. It's lovely to see how many have tuned in today. Thank you very much. You have got some great experts here to quiz. So pop your questions in the Q&A. We'll take as many as we can, but really lovely to hear what it is that you want to know. And I, I'm interested if I could go over to Adrian, because um, the European health data space, uh, you now represent parliamentarians. You were an M MP in the UK for, for 18 years. Now a, a wider perspective. We have amazing data when it's in the NHS, but can that be brought in? Can the wider context uh, be brought together here so that there's a real sharing of this data across Europe, Adrian? Pop your, pop your mic on. <laughs> it's not a webinar if the mic's <laughs> not muted. <laughs> That's great. Um, what was your take? Yeah, you've hit the nail on the head. The, um, the collection of data is a lot easier than the sharing. And the sharing has to come with permissions. And we're in a world where the public are suspicious of shared information, of shared data. The UK is going through a phrase of a, a bill in Parliament at the moment, where I, 
can already see a campaign rising uh, to try and prevent it. And it's about uh, the National Health Service sharing its data. Um, and, and there's a lot of suspicion about that. So there's, a, there's work to be done on persuading the decision makers who give the permission as to what the purpose is for the data sharing. It's pretty obvious to the panel, it's probably pretty obvious to most of the audience that are interested in the subject. But when you get down to the people who write letters to the papers, sign petitions, uh, and get angry about things, um, the narrative is wrong. And we need a narrative that can get across to people what the benefits of the data sharing is and you need interlocutors between those who are the professionals and the experts uh, with the decision makers themselves, who at the end of the day are looking to the public for a lead. And if the public is saying, don't do that, then they are unlikely to do that, when actually some of them even know they should be doing that. That unfortunately is how democracy works. Thank you. Um, it's lovely to see more questions coming in. We'll come to those, but just picking up on that thread about trusting that information. Jay, if I could ask you, you have expertise in data science and collection of data. That whole question about the protection, the reassurance that Ch Chantal touched on earlier as well. How can there be that reassurance then so that these um, data registries, the health data space can actually be secure and people can trust it? I think it comes in two parts. I mean, one one thing for the UK system is that they, the trust in the system has been eroded by a demand management mindset. So, you know, the demand management mindset of the National Health Service from a need to save costs has caused a very, you can't have this mentality. So, you know, when someone comes to the system and asks, or I've heard about this latest technology, can we talk about how I might be able to to get it, it's instantly a, that's very expensive. We're not going to be able to get that to you, kind of ma management mindset that comes in. And and then, you know, you start trialing it yourself, you pay for it yourself. I currently pay for a lot of my own technology, which seems alien to some of the other countries around the world uh, who do have this on reimbursement. Um, and I've shown the data works and I've shown for me the data works. But when I put it into my own context, for some reason that then gets lost within the system, within the mess of the system. And I come from a procurement, uh, a, a commissioning mindset. So I've, I've been on both sides of that line and know how to navigate the system. And I find it difficult. And, and so from that perspective, I think the trust in that, in the ability of the system to contextualize my data has been lost entirely. So the natural response becomes one of, you're gonna share my data irresponsibly um, as a result. So if the trust in the people looking after me is gone, then I won't trust why they're even gonna collect the data in the first place. So. And I don't say that by, by attacking specific doctors, I say that by attacking the systems mindset as a whole, um, because I think that's just what's happened over the last few years. And that's just a shame, really. In terms of what we can do to get back on track, you look at people like Parth Bakar and what he's done in terms of getting Libra prescription in the NHS. It was all based upon very good grassroots campaigning with patient groups and then using source data from those individuals with the specific intention of I want to present this data at a national context to be able to get you something which you're demanding. That was something which was very, very logical to thought through and people donated their own data to that campaign to make that happen. Thank you. Um, to pick up a question that's um, one of the ones coming in now, um, I'd like to put this to Chantal and to Tammy. What is the potential for patients uh, with better EU data registries? Firstly, Tammy, um, in the context of what you were saying about health inequalities, how could better data uh, benefit patients, uh, particularly where there are social and health inequalities, Tammy? Well, <laughs> I hear what you're all saying, and I and I think you're right to question it now and and sort of and think because I think the health inequalities uh, world has has just only in the last few years also started asking itself these questions about how we we can sort of better communicate and better have a sort of what we call patient centered or there's many different terms for it. Um, it's not easy. <laughs> Um, and I think it is about empowering patients. Um, but I think for me, one of the issues is also there are patients who don't want to be empowered. And that's partly because their lives are so complex um, that you have to, you really do have to sort of ferry them along and put more of an effort into it. So I think 
I'm also very aware that when we talk about patients, we're also talking about the very, the, the vocal patients, the middle-class patients. And we have to make sure that in any efforts we do to try and include people and, and get them more involved with some of the issues that Jay was talking about, we really have to make an effort to make sure that these patient groups are a bit more representative and we're, we're reaching out as much as we can. I don't think there are any easy answers for this though. And thank you. And, and Chantal, what's your take on that? What benefit could uh, this better national or European level data collection bring for diabetes patients? Well, I think first of all, if you ask me, what can we as an individual country, a small country like Belgium, for instance, learn from uh, Europe. It's all about uh, benchmarking. In, in our country, for instance, we have this uh, quality insurance uh, system called ICAT, where we collect data on insulin treated patients. And uh, it's not just collecting, but we also run quality circles where we benchmark our own centers against uh, the other centers, hemoglobin, you know, outcome uh, um, uh, parameters, uh, process uh, indicators, uh, how often do you measure hemoglobin A1C, do you measure blood pressure, etc. And so by benchmarking, you stimulate improvement in quality. And so you can imagine that we, if we do this European, you know, Europe-wide, you could see Belgium feeling, mm, Poland is doing a better job than me in measuring hemoglobin A1C, I want to move up. So um, it, I, I think benchmarking, you know, doing something with the data, like benchmarking, uh, running, in, you know, uh, initiatives around uh, information uh, around smoking uh, cessation is happening well in Poland, but not in Belgium, do something about it. So it's, uh, it's, it's very interesting to see how data registries and then analyzing the data and communicating on them can uh, initiate quality improvement circles. So I do believe that for the individual person living with diabetes, having a big European initiative will have an impact because their region, their country, it, it, it will all yeah, escalate towards them. Thank you. So so okay. if I can just uh, jump in, if you don't mind. Um, we heard uh, uh, that there is a lot of possibility to have good predictors, good clinical predictors, hyperglycemia, Jeanette was highlighting, blood pressure, cholesterol, for example, but also social one from TAM. That in registry uh, can really help to have a better reactive medicine, but also a more proactive medicine, picking and targeting the high risk subgroup population. That's why it's very important to, uh, to approach the data and registry in a way that uh, is really focused on improving people with uh, uh, diabetes life, uh, improving outcomes. The second consideration, I really don't think that people do not want to have a better glucose control. It's just they are not equipped to it because they are taking 300 decisions per day. It's a very complex task that this disease is asking every single day. And that's why for us it's also important that, that the innovation has to be allowed and uh, nurture, enable in this field, innovation from a pharmaceutical standpoint, but also from a healthcare management standpoint. That's why it's very, very important for us and also this piece. And thanks, you mentioned um, with FP there, I know FP has done some research with the Economist Intelligence Unit, which found that trying to achieve integrated uh, diabetes systems yes had all sorts of challenges, um, how you vertically or horizontally integrate the services, but also they pointed out the financial integration and the IT integration, which is so important to, to draw this together and ties into a question we've got now from Shirley Maylard, um, saying, I find many healthcare professionals are collecting inaccurate data during consultations. Can algorithms help rule out these errors? How far away are we from the development uh, being used across the EU despite language barriers? Jay, you're probably an AI expert. How can these the wrong data going in make right data coming out? 
Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily describe myself as an AI expert, but there's there's definitely a very simple uh, way of dealing with some of these errors that go in. And, and the simplest way is by allowing patient access to their data. Mm -hmm. You clean, you naturally clean up some of these issues, like very, very naturally. So, you know, I got access to my, my primary care record and there were things that I didn't notice or recognize on there that were wrong. And there were things that were, um, you know, things which my gender couldn't have <laughs> on those uh, on on my my list of, of conditions that i had so you know if, if i get access to my own records i can sense check them because as Maurizio quite rightly pointed out i've made some of those 300 decisions um in a day i'm looking at it every day i know what my conditions are i can help to clean that up quite well um so that's one big area it's a very human element to things that allows you to solve the problem when it comes to ai and the use of technology um, you've got systems out there already. So in, in the National Health Service, we have a, you know, a lot of data cleaning tools that are currently used within the data sets across Europe. Similar people are doing some of the things as simple as rule based engines. So not going the full AI route, but just by saying if this is a condition which someone who has this clinical pro profile shouldn't be able to have, then let's just find out whether that is send it for review, make sure that it's being cleaned up. So I think we should go for the easy stuff first, is my view. Um, and then as we go into the hardest, and then when, once we're trying to make those tweaks and changes further down the line, we can then start getting into things like AI. I think AI, you know, it still is good. It's good in certain use cases. Um, you are working with a company called Mendelian at the moment that's doing fantastic work around AI and rare diseases and identification of rare diseases. Um, but I still think that there is a little bit of a way to go to take it from where it is now into full wholesale cleaning up all of these problems which may be in literally is something as simple as someone writing the wrong thing in their notes um, or recording the wrong thing on a computer or typing in the wrong letter on a code um, for example those are the sorts of problems that you're trying to solve here and and I don't think those get completely solved by AI um, mm. would be my my opinion there and a question that's come in from Anne-Marie Felton saying, in the data space, no mention has been made of the healthcare system in the context of diabetes services, uh, characteristics of diabetes services not universally agreed. Uh, who'd like to pick that one up? Chantal, maybe for you. Yeah, and, and Anne, Anne uh, puts her finger exactly on, on the problem we have in Europe. And um, we have different healthcare systems, country per country per country, and sometimes even per region. And um, so pushing top down uh, a system uh, will never work. So you need to have end end. You need, I'm a big believer in, in having European uh, data collections, but to allow regional national translations that are appropriate to the healthcare systems that work in each uh, country or in, in each region. Uh, so um, still, I believe that Europe has a big role to play um, um, only to, to bring up best practices from, from different countries. We, we have, for instance, the whole Scandinavian example where data registries are fantastic, are linked to um, all kinds of other registries. Um, so we can learn from that, but then we can learn from other uh, initiatives like our little Belgian initiatives where we have perhaps our registries that are not so good, but at least we have action coupled to some of the registries. So um, European bringing together of, of all of the, um, the data that are, that are out there and then do something with it because if it's just data, we will never get anywhere. And Anne is fully right. We need to translate to the nations, to the countries where different healthcare systems exist. And, and Adrian, could you pick up on, on that thought? Because I'm, what Chantal's saying there about trying to make it relevant in the context of each healthcare system with your overview, with your organization, Diabetes Global Network, do, do, you, do you see this problem? Do you see that the solutions need to be localized? How, how, do, how do you perceive it? Uh, could pop your pop your mic on again, Adrian. Uh, the importance of the European Union is in setting standards, and um, also in uh, coming up with frameworks that countries outside of the EU can adopt if they so choose. 
at the end of the day, whether in the EU or outside, it's actually at the member state level that you have the health function uh, or most of the health competences, uh, and in some countries down to regions as well. And that's where the decision makers, the politicians come in, because they are the ones who have to take the decisions. And so working closely uh, between uh, the theoretical and the practical, somewhere in the middle are these guys, women and men, who make these decisions in chambers. And it's getting to them the reasons why those changes are necessary. And it's getting to them in a way that it's actually coming from the grassroots up and not from the top down, even though it's the top down that is inevitably going to be uh, where the framework is developed. Thank you. We'll just take one more question before we turn to our MEP, who has kindly joined us. Um, another question that's come in from, from the public there, which is fantastic that, that, that you're bringing these in now. Whose duty would it be to report country data to uh, the European framework? Maurizio, is that one for you? I'm not sure to ever get it. Sorry, Sue. And um, just a question that's come in about whose duty it would be to report country data to a European framework. How could that come together? Well, the European framework can be a great platform integrating uh, uh, the national piece, as uh, Chantal uh, said. So obviously I'm not a subject matter expert here, but uh, uh, definitely we need to consider the peculiarity of the healthcare system. While uh, the framework at European level can really create the condition and the platform for a full integration, then the national piece has to be integrated and making sure that the data are, as we said, reliable and relevant, comparable, as Jeanette said. So that's our interpretation of the European health data space is a great opportunity to review the policy related uh, and making sure that the framework support uh, the national efforts in, uh, in doing this. Yeah. Starting from uh, one basic assumption that we need to act now since uh, uh, these disease deserve uh, really attention. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Will panels stay with us? Thank you very much for all those insights and to all of the audience who've submitted questions. Um, if you do still have a burning question that didn't get answered, you can submit it by replying to the email that confirmed your registration and uh, the team will get back to you. But I'm delighted now uh, to welcome member of the European Parliament, Christian Boussoy from Romania. Um, MEP Boussoy, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Um, would you like to give us your thoughts on, from a policy perspective, about the value of health data registries? It would be very helpful to, to hear your thoughts and welcome it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation and uh, congratulations for uh, discussing this uh, important issue in a, a very good uh, moment because uh, uh, what COVID-19 uh, showed us uh, and made for us much clearer was the fact that uh, <clears throat> we need to uh, further integrate and further develop uh, uh, e-health solutions and digitalization in health. With the high prevalence of patients suffering of uh, chronic disease, including diabetes, there is a need uh, first to increase the level of recognition of NCDs as a key health priority for the European Union. This is something that we discussed several times in the European Parliament. In uh, the case of COVID-19, managing uh, uh, NCDs will be a prerequisite for successful containment. As the Lancet NCD countdown 2030 report showed, although premature mortality from uh, non-communicable diseases is falling, the total number of people living with chronic diseases is growing. Uh, we uh, should not only address COVID-19 and other health threats uh, uh, similar uh, in the future, but we also need to address, to continue to address, and even uh, strengthen our efforts and uh, increase our uh, results uh, to address hypertension, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular and chronic respiratory diseases and uh, cancer. And paying greater attention to non communicable diseases is not an agenda that goes uh, beyond this pandemic, but it should be seen as an integral part. As you already know, as a 
uh, direct consequence of COVID-19, uh, EU proposed a new very ambitious health program, EU for Health. I'm the rapporteur of the European Parliament for this program. And uh, what we aim with this program in coordination with the European Commission, of course, and uh, with member states, uh, is to strengthen new health systems by also raising awareness, uh, to improve early diagnosis, to increase health promotion and increase uptake of digital tools and services that enable prevention, treatment where suitable, monitoring, and also the continuity of uh, care. Non-communicable diseases are strongly integrated in the EU for health and the dimension of prevention and health promotion will benefit at least 20% of the total budget. The EU for health program in general terms should make EU health systems more resilient able to face current weaknesses, such as medicine shortages, and address chronic diseases, strengthen or fight against cancer, but also support the health sector to go to digital. And one of uh, these solutions and one of the priorities and the proposals that we made in European Parliament is to develop the electronic European health record, to build electronic registries everywhere in the European Union and of course, for uh, diabetes uh, patients, this could be also important because this uh, uh, electronic uh, registries and the European health record uh, interrelation between the national health records, uh, electronic health records, will mean to improve availability and quality of healthcare. And of course, patients will get access to treatment more rapidly and easily. Patient registries confer clear insights into diagnostics, complications, and treatment. Moreover, if these registries will be available and implemented at the national level and further interoperable in case, of, uh, in case the patient travels or chooses to be treated somewhere else in another member state, in case of chronic patients, this would have the potential uh, to enhance the comparison and exchange of outcomes and allocate resources and interventions were most needed. And of course, in the case of diabetes patients, it would mean better glycemic control, blood pressure management, and uh, long-term outcomes. And of course, we can manage better comorbidities uh, of uh, diabetes uh, patients. Uh, I also uh, very much emphasize, and I will finish, uh, I will go to the uh, conclusion with this, uh, the need to work in synergies. And here as uh, Industry Research and Energy Committee Chair, very focused on uh, the research area. And uh, I have great expectations from uh, Horizon Europe, the health trend to uh, give a lot of opportunities to European doctors, researchers, academicians to uh, improve the methods of diagnosis, to find new cures, new treatments, so we need to build synergies, synergies between new for health between Horizon Europe, between, uh, of course, the cohesion funds, the national resilience and recovery plans, where uh, investments in health uh, are very much encouraged. And of course, with the Digital Europe program, where we could find some opportunities to finance initiatives for e-health systems. I believe that uh, uh, this pandemic shows us the need to increase uh, and to give uh, a particular better focus to healthcare in general, and of course to non-communicable diseases in particular because patients suffered from the lack of uh, hospitalization, the lack of proper treatment, the lack of addressing to the right doctor. And uh, uh, these lessons will uh, be beneficial for us in the future to make our health systems more resilient. Thank you so much. Um, Emmy Pibusoy, thank you so much. That was a fantastic run through of, of what's promised, what's out there. If we just have a, a minute or so, <clears throat> our panel is still with us. Um, Chantal, very quickly, do you want to have something to say to the MEP there? There's a wonderful smorgasbord of, of, of opportunities he's offering you. Does that uh, hit the target? Oh, absolutely. It was music to my ears, actually. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Busoy, for joining us yet again. Um, can I just ask you um, a, a question? I heard very clearly from you that the EU for Health 
you really want to put emphasis on, on NCDs like obesity, like diabetes, you want to link up with research horizon. Um, how will you um, emphasize the importance of diseases like diabetes in that? Because we hear quite disturbing messages that Europe wants to put their emphasis on research in NCDs on cancer and neurodegenerative diseases. So how will you convince your colleagues to also put diabetes and cardiovascular disease and as you said, chronic lung disease, et cetera, high on the agenda of research? Thank you so much. Yes, indeed, this is true that uh, cancer is maybe the main uh, public policy in the health area of uh, European Union uh, now. And you remember that uh, EU beating cancer plan and uh, the idea to focus a little bit more on cancer uh, was uh, even before the pandemic started with the uh, uh, starting of the work of the new commission and with the letter of commissioner, uh, uh, for commissioner uh, for health for Madame Kiriakides uh, from the president of uh, European commission. And uh, it is true that if we focus ourselves a little bit more on uh, cancer in the coming years, uh, we could do a big difference with the uh, instruments that we have now and with the technologies and with the discoveries that uh, are ready to, to be implemented. But it's not only about cancer. It, it shouldn't be only about cancer. Uh, you're right, we have to, uh, to, to, to find a good balance and not to forget, forget about uh, cardiovascular patients, about diabetes patients, uh, these, are, these are chronic diseases that could also be addressed successfully and the impact on the health uh, of uh, those people which are suffering from these diseases and also on the society in general would be huge if we invest uh, the appropriate uh, budget uh, for this. We had uh, just uh, days ago, maybe 10 days ago, uh, a discussion in the European Parliament uh, with the European Commission for the first year of EU for Health. Uh, it will be half of year because uh, the program will start uh, in mid-summer. And uh, the main priorities that we uh, settled, uh, that we established in the legislation, we saw in the working plan of European Commission. And the director from European Commission, Mr. Hudson, uh, uh, mentioned the non-communicable diseases and uh, mentioned not only cancer, but also the others. So uh, uh, EU4Health will finance sections for prevention, for uh, better management, for exchange of good practices, different other projects in all those areas. And I can assure you that uh, if there are projects in the area of diabetes, uh, I will lobby for them. And uh, we try to accommodate not only the cancer initiatives, but also the main uh, diseases that are affected, uh, affecting uh, our European citizens. Thank you very much. And if, if you need any help, IDF, ESD, all together in the European Diabetes Forum, we are here to give I you know, data to support you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much, MEP Boussoy, for joining us and for your contribution today. That's been so helpful indeed. And now as we draw towards the end of our session, uh, I'd like to e ask each of our panel about what they've learned from these discussions. And I was interested to note that it's 100 years since insulin was discovered and made such an impact on, on the treatment of diabetes. And now we're talking about health data registries. Uh, we're understanding a little bit more about the syndemic and all of the factors that come into play. Could I ask each of our panel very briefly, one sentence please, to say how you feel the value of health data registries might help in the management of diabetes going forwards. Tammy, perhaps to you first, just very briefly. Bring patients along. And I think that's come out strong in the last hour and a half that we need to make sure that this just isn't a clinician-led initiative but to bring patients along. Thank you. And that was a point made by Nicholas Brook in, in the comments and uh, questions there. Get that patient engagement to align the data sets that, that you're bringing. Thank you. Jeanette, what's your, your point there? I agree. Bring the patients along. But what I just took away from this one and a half hour is the, the reassuring message from MEP Boussoy, which is that we need to address the non-communicable diseases because they are at the basis of other things. We, we have an exacerbated 
COVID pandemic because of the, the non-communicable diseases. And if we can prevent, predict, and address those, we are much better suited for the future. Thank you. Jay, what would you say? Um, I think one, one thing I've learned is that the number of things being done across Europe to solve this problem is very high. I mean, just uh, in the last hour and a half, we've heard about everything from what industry is doing across to what policymakers are doing, what individual clinicians are doing. Uh, and that's really encouraging as a patient living with the condition and, and the willingness to be able to solve that problem of, of equity of access, I think is the big thing that I, I want to, I want to take away from today. And it started with Tammy and was, was very expertly uh, alluded to as well by Mr. Basoy. So I, I really, I really applaud that. And that's what I, I'm going to take away. Thank you, Adrian, your thoughts. Um, well, firstly, don't forget that, that diabetes is a pandemic and, and will continue to be a pandemic uh, whilst it remains uh, untackled. The need for an holistic approach was made very clearly by Tammy, and the need to involve politicians at the grassroots in actually finding the solutions that release the data uh, so that that uh, can be acted upon. Um, and also important to remember, patients are not necessarily just data. Um, there's a little bit more to it than that, and we don't we must lose sight of that. Yes, thank you. Patients are not just data. Maurizio, your thought, final thought there. Uh, I think that uh, after 100 years from the insulin discovery in Toronto lab, uh, and despite the multiple uh, initiative that has been launched in the last 30 years, starting from the St. Vincent Declaration, um, the improvement in diabetes care has not been enough strong. And uh, we need to act now. And starting from uh, uh, data and registry, because we'll enable a better management of diabetes, saving lives, and optimize also the current resource that are available. Thank you. Well, thank you so much to all the speakers, all the panel, and to MEP Christian Boussoy for joining us for this event. It's been my great pleasure to guide everyone through the discussions and now to hand over to Chantal Mathieu to close the event. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, and uh, thank you to the speakers and uh, the panelists, and in particular, Mr. Boussoy, for being with us today. I, I think um, it was such a, an inspiring conversation, again, illustrating how uh, COVID, what we have learned ab about this horrible thing, is, is also the good thing that, indeed, we need to harness our systems to be uh, more prepared it's sad to say that this new epidemic uh, is showing us how to be more prepared for the old epidemic. <laughs> the old epidemics, I should say, obesity, uh, cardiovascular disease, and in particular, diabetes. And so I really look forward to um, this European health data space as <clears throat> a means to uh, bring together all these initiatives that uh, happen everywhere in, in Europe on, on data gathering. Um, I heard very clearly uh, the importance of, of the non-communicable diseases like diabetes to be uh, at the forefront for data collection because this epidemic underlies all the other epidemics and this causes of the causes was very important as a statement because only by gathering data um, will we be able to, to, to get to the root of everything. And um, what was interesting is that we discussed just a little bit about obstacles, because normally when I sit with clinicians and, and, and with um, uh, regulators, the first thing they, they start is the obstacles, you know, everything that makes it so difficult, GDPR didn't fall today, you know, all these things. Today, we talked about the opportunities, what was very inspiring uh, to me, and, and the fact that so many things uh, already exist. Um, I also heard very clearly uh, that we not only need to collect data, we need novel technologies, we need e-health, uh, we need electronic records to, 
get trusted data to get solid data. I also heard very clearly, let the person living with the disease own their own data and curate their data, clean their data, as uh, Jay uh, said, that is very important. So we will know that the date of birth is co correct, but also that Jay was never pregnant. So uh, uh, all of these things are, are very important to have trusted data. I also heard very clearly from Mr. Boussoy that uh, EU for Health is in communication with Horizon and, and other uh, research initiatives, because I do believe we need to examine the data, scrutinize the data, but then finally also uh, communicate and educate uh, about the data, and uh, because this is very important, and communicate in, in, in clear ways. And then finally, having a European initiative, yes, but as Anne Felton said, translate it to the, uh, to the, the countries, to the local uh, healthcare uh, systems. And it really brings me to uh, another uh, highlight of, uh, well, Im important pillar of uh, the European Diabetes Forum, not only data and novel technologies, but also integrated care, because everybody will have to be uh, together uh, to do something with the data, because we need to take action, as uh, Maurizio uh, clearly said it, not just collect data, but do something with the data. And so it's an invitation for our next uh, webinar uh, somewhere in October that will be about integrated care, because that also is key for a disease like diabetes. So thank you, Sue, for uh, giving me the final word. Thank you. Thank you to everybody today. Thank you.